So before I get started, I want to be honest and give my um, sources inspirations, if you will, because a lot of times I struggle with that, with telling you where I got information from, because when I preach, I'm not that smart or crazy. I don't come up with everything I say myself, and sometimes I don't say that, so don't, I don't want you to think that I'm a genius and I come up with everything myself, because no, that's not the case. So. I bring this up to be honest and transparent with you all. If you don't care, whatever, but I care. I want to be honest with you guys. So for today, we're talking about Jesus' death on the cross and what that really means. And for that, I went through two books, which I highly recommend to you guys. One is by Tim Keller. It's called Jesus the King. It's a mini commentary on the book of Mark, and it's really cool. It's really practical. It's really easy to follow. It's a super powerful book, and Ellie told me to read it. I haven't read it in full yet, so sorry if I'm being a hypocrite here, but I've read part of it, and it's really good, so you should read it all. And then this other book called The Divine Dance, and this is more about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what that means, and what that means for us in our lives right now. I recommend both of them. I haven't read both of them in full, so I'm sorry. I want to read them. Next time I preach, hopefully I have read them so that I'm honest before you guys. I want to read those. And you guys should read those too. They're really cool. So talk to me if you want to borrow them, read them. They're great books. They're really cool. So that's where I want to start. But so what we're talking about is the death of Jesus, right? We all know this. You all know the story. We've all heard it. How God sent his son Jesus willingly on this earth. He was God way up above us, way beyond. And he chose to come down to this earth as a human, as a baby, helpless baby, lived a life on earth. And if you remember that life, it wasn't popular, grand, he wasn't a king, he wasn't loved by everyone, he wasn't given a standing ovation in every room he went to. In fact, we know it was really the opposite. Not many people liked him, a lot of people didn't like him, he was controversial, people wanted him dead, people didn't know what to do with him. And we know that his death was not just passing away in old age in his sleep, no, it was painful, excruciating, it was also humiliating. We know how he went through all this just for the chance that we could be saved and go to heaven. Right? That's the gospel story. That's the message of the cross, and that's the truth for us today. And we should really ponder it and think about it all the time, just continue to be in awe of how wonderful, how amazing he is. And this is something that's really been on my heart lately. Because there's so much to this. There's so much more than just what's at the surface. So we're going to start by reading the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. In the book of Mark, chapter 15, you can flip over if you want. Mark 15, we're going to start reading the first part, verses 1 through 15. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. You see, it says, Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law the entire hell council meant to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they're bringing against you? And Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. He doesn't fight against it. He doesn't argue. He just, he's silent. It's fascinating to us. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. And one of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. So the crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. So would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews, Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. At this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. And so to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip 
and turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. It's a heavy start, right? Sorry if you weren't expecting this from me today, but this is really powerful and really important to us. See what Jesus went through here. His own people who he was trying to save want him dead like right now. They want him dead more than the Romans do. And Romans, their enemy, supposedly. It's unfair. He's being hated. Unjustly so. We see how this crucifixion, this suffering he went through was brutal. You read it there, he flogged with a lead tip whip. I, I won't go into the details if that stuff is hard for you to handle, but if you've seen parts of the Passion of the Christ, it shows that. And it might be it maybe dra dramatizes some things, but those are the things they did. They Romans and peoples of that time loved to physically torture people. They were incredible at it. It was like their top skill. These things are brutal. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. And we continue on down to verse 25. It says, It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, King of the Jews. And two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. See, he didn't put up much of a fight. He allowed himself to be beat and crucified. Then the stuff was brutal, like I said. For crucifixions like this, prisoners were usually stripped naked and tied to a wooden post so they couldn't run away or move and just flogged over and over until, who knows, the people were sick of it or ready to be done. They did as much as they wanted, getting flesh torn out, skin torn out. It was nasty. A lot of people died just from this flogging part. And then we see he's being kicked, spit on, hit in the head over and over. They were forced to carry the beam of the cross, however many miles, however far it was. Nailed with these big nails. These are not just like, you know, little finish nails. They're like three quarters inch thick, like huge nails on both hands and the feet. Lifted up, left there for hours. They didn't kill him right away. They just let him die of suffocation until they couldn't breathe anymore. Right? All that is brutal enough, right? That's pretty horrible. And it's not only that. While that's happening, he's being mocked and ridiculed and made fun of by everyone. No one's on his side. His disciples, we know, they, let, they abandoned him. They left him. They, as soon as they saw the danger, they left. They deserted him. And everyone else, the Romans killing him or mocking him, making fun of him. Oh, you're a king? All right. Let me beat you up, this king. His own people, who he's trying to save, they wanted this to happen, and they probably were enjoying it. Who knows, but... And even we see the men next to him, we see in some stories, they're hurling insults at him, the people crucified right next to him. Like, ha, you're our king? Yeah, right. You're just as bad as us. You're being crucified with us. What good are you? Everyone is treating him horribly. And think about this. This is the Son of God. This is our savior being treated like this. He's like being treated worse than an animal. This is the death and sacrifice of Jesus, church. Well, in part, in church, this is what I'm going to go into, how there's more than just what we see at the surface. This is in part the sacrifice and death of Jesus, this cross, what he went through, but there's even a lot more to that. Because think about it. Jesus was not the only human being crucified, right? We know that in our heads, but when we think of crucifixion, 
think of Jesus, because that's the most famous story and example of it. But if we just read the story, there's two people crucified right next to him. They probably had similar things happen to them, similar punishment, and sure they didn't get as much attention as Jesus, but there's a lot of people throughout history crucified. I was looking this up, and historians estimate hundreds of thousands, probably more, millions maybe, of people were crucified all over the world. And there's other practices that other nations and peoples would do, and some of the things they did was probably worse than what Jesus went through. There's some pretty horrific things that I'm not going to say and talk about. If you're interested, you can look into it, but there's some really brutal things that people have done to other people. So, think about it. The death itself was horrible and awful, yes, but it wasn't something that had never been seen before, right? Stick, stick with me. Stick with me. Um, I'm not trying to diminish the, the death of Jesus. No. I'm trying to say that there's more. There's more suffering he went through than just that. It was only a fraction of what he really went through. And church, I struggle how to say this right, but I think for me what I've been looking to as I've been looking into this is that maybe the death itself, the suffering, that, that, I'm, I don't know if that's what saved us. Now hold on. Don't walk out the door. Don't shut me out, tune me out, and leave. If you want to talk about it, I'd love to talk, look into this more. Um, because we are saved by the cross, right? It's Christianity 101, Brad. What are you talking about? Again, I'm not diminishing that at all. What I'm saying is, I think that was a symbol, a vivid reminder for us to try and help comprehend what Jesus really went through. Because we know the story of the garden where he doesn't want to do it, he doesn't want to go through with it, he's really struggling. He says, Father, take this from me. He's struggling. I think it's later in the story we see what he was really struggling with. I don't think it was so much the death, Although I'm sure that was stressful and he didn't want to go through with that, I'm sure. I think if we keep reading in the story, we see what the true suffering was. We see in verses 33 and 34. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani? Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the verses I'm going to highlight and we're going to focus on. This, I believe, is the true suffering of Jesus, what he really went through. Again, the cross was suffering as well, for sure. But I think what Jesus was really having a hard time with was this part right here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he's not just saying this. This isn't a rhetorical question. This is actually what's going on as he is being forsaken by God, by his Father, by himself. This Greek word here for forsaken means to abandon, to desert, to leave completely helpless, to be utterly forsaken, totally abandoned. The New Living Translation translates this verse as, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And so we see in this moment, for this brief moment, he was completely cut off from the relationship with his father. You following me? Again, please feel free to talk to me. If you're confused or unsure or want to work through this, I'd love to do that. This is what Jesus' suffering was, being separated from his father. And we're going to dive into this. We're going to look into what this means and what this means for us. Because this is stuff that is difficult to comprehend because there's, it's difficult. It's spiritual stuff. It's stuff we can't comprehend very easy. Because separation, right? Most of us, I'm sure all of us, understand the feeling of separation, of being separated from someone, someone we love. Whether it was out of our control or whether it was our fault, maybe. We've experienced separation, right? So what makes this separation so different? Jesus is separated from his father. 
I'm sure some of us, or you know someone who has been separated from their father, whether through death or other situations. What makes this separation different, special? Yes, he's Jesus and God, but what does that mean? This is where we get into the Trinity and what that means. This is complex. Trinity is a tough thing, right? Churches and people have debated it for thousands of years, what it is, what it means, all of that. The word Trinity is never even in the Bible. It's a word that was created later. It's, it's tricky stuff. We're to see how God, how he, how he loved us this much to break off his relationship with himself. I'm going to read Philippians chapter 2. Again, there's not many examples of this idea of the Trinity, but I'm going to go over a few of them quick. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used with his own advantage. Let's think about that. Jesus being in very nature God. Jesus is God, and he's God's son. How, let's think about it. How does that really make sense? And like it kind of doesn't, but that's kind of the point. So we're not going to fully understand it. It's something we can wrestle with. But Jesus, when he was down to earth, was still very much God. And he didn't use that quality to his advantage, but he came down, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that is true. Again, that is the sacrifice of Jesus in going to the cross, yes. We, we emphasize that part for sure. And I think verses 6 and 7 are just as much a sacrifice, if not more, of making himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, coming down from this relationship we had with the Father and the Spirit. Jesus is God, right? We believe that. That's what the doctrine of the Trinity tells us. Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God, they're the Trinity. They're all together. Again, there's not many things that talk about this idea. It's tricky. Not many passages. But one of my favorites is John chapter 17, verse 24. It says, Jesus is praying. He says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Step back. Isn't that wild to think about? Before the creation of the world? I don't know about you guys, but those kind of things to me, like, blow my mind. What does that mean? Before the creation of the world, was there anything? Was there nothing? What, what does that mean, right? That's what, I, I could spend my whole life studying that. What does that mean? Before the creation of the world, there was just the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Where were they? Like, what? This is stuff that is just too big for us and too beyond us. I, I can't get it. But I love looking into this stuff. And these verses are fascinating. God and Jesus had this love for each other and the Spirit before the creation of the world. How long? I don't think time exists for them. Like, it was just forever, eternal. Like, this stuff's crazy. This is one of the few glimpses we get of what anything was before creation, right? That's stuff that's beyond us. We can't comprehend that. The Trinity, this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they've been in this relationship of love forever. We can see that in this verse. They've been loving each other, faithful to one another. And there's so much love. This is something that early Christians called a divine dance, and that's where I get that book from. That's where that's helped me a lot. It's a very, very interesting concept, but it's really cool. Because we see that before life itself, there was love. There was love between God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the whole basis for our lives now. Again, I'm getting into all this deep stuff, and I'm trying not to be too out there and too confusing. But this is the foundation for our relationships now, right? Our life is about relationships. And sometimes they're hard and messy and difficult, and sometimes we'd rather just not have 
any of those and just be our own person. And that's what our world tells us to be successful. Be your own person, right? Be your own man or be your own woman. Be successful. Don't worry about anyone else. I think that's really not how we're made to be, right? We're made to be in relationship with each other. Those relationships are difficult. But this is what we've had from the beginning. This is the foundation, is this trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfect relationship for forever. You see in this divine dance book, it says, God is not seen as a distant, static monarch, but as a divine, circle dance. God is the Holy One, presence in the dynamic and loving action of three. This is what God is. This is what this is all about. He's not just up there in the clouds watching us from above. He is life itself. He is love. And again, this is stuff we can't fully understand and comprehend. And so it shouldn't be a turnoff to us. Maybe it's not really, you're not interested in it and don't want to study it, which is okay. But I think this is something we should all at least try and think about in our head how this works. So this stuff is difficult, and I'm sorry if I'm being confusing out there. Um, I'm, that's why I've got some analogies to try and help us to understand this concept of the Trinity, and again, what it means for our life. A lot of the stuff is like, what's the point? What does this mean for my life? Who really cares? Like, I don't understand this. Bear with me. I'm, I'm going to get there. So first, just try and think about in your life, right now where you're sitting, in your life you're doing right now, think about the best relationship you've ever had. Whether it was a partner, a spouse, a parent, a child, a sibling, a friend, other family member, take the time right now to think back throughout your life and think of that relationship, that special person in your life. Think about it. Hopefully, there is pure love and devotion for each other. You really cared about each other, wanted the best for each other, would help each other out through thick and thin. And sure, even the best of relationships aren't perfect. We all know that. That's just human life, human nature. We're going to have arguments, fightings, and disagreements and all that. But I just want us right now to just reflect on those really important relationships we've had and what made them so special. Think about it. What made them so special? Think about those memories. And this is what the Trinity is, this relationship. That's what this faith is all about. I've talked about it before, and I'm going to keep talking about it. That's what our faith is, Christianity. It's not just the rules and doing this and don't do that. That's part of it, but at the core of it is relationship and love. And this is what the Trinity is. This is what God is. God is relationship, and God is love. And that's our faith, right? And this divine dance, if you call it, want to call it that, this trinity, this is perfect. This is beautiful. There's no rough pat patches in their dance. There's no bad moods, no arguments. There's no heartbreak. There's no difficult or trying circumstances. There's no separation. There's no divorce here. Again, this has been all eternity. It's been perfect and just pure love for each other. Again, like I've said before, God is life. He is love. That's his nature. That's just who he is. That's where all the love and life and goodness comes from our world. It's just, it just comes from God. That's part of the Trinity. That's one way to understand it. Another example I've got is from this book, The Divine Dance, and it's a more physical, practical one. I've got this. You guys know what this is? Who can shout it out first? Rubber band. There you go. You're correct. You win. Thanks. Good job. Sorry, I don't have a natural prize. But this is a rubber band, right? Nothing crazy. Something small, tiny. We use them all the time. We break them all the time. We just throw them out. Whatever, right? Just a rubber band. Nothing special. What I want to think about is just how it works. It's a weird material, right? Look at when I'm stretching it out, and it comes back in. It's, it's this thing I'm applying centrifugal force, right? Pressing it out from the inside, and it's all coming out together. And as soon as I release, it immediately comes back. I don't have to do anything. 
it just immediately comes back in towards itself with my fingers at the center, right? And what he says in this divine dance book is it's one complete motion, moving out, allowing itself to be pulled back in. This analogy is from this divine dance book, right? A rubber band, something simple. It moves out and in. It's one motion. It's a flow, if you will. It's not a robot or some rigid movement. It's a flowing thing, right? And this is something simple and silly. But this is just an image that he came up with to help us think of the Trinity, the divine dance. It's a cycle of love, freely giving and receiving, right? It's one motion, it's a flow, it's natural. It's what the thing was made to do, right? The rubber band is made to stretch, to go out and go back in. And that's what God and the Trinity and relationship is about. It's made to go out, to give love, and receive it back. And that's what relationship is. That's what God has been. That's what he wants for us. You might be thinking, okay, Brad, you're kind of losing me. You're giving me the science lesson on rubber bands. Great, I didn't come here for that. What's the point of this? And what's the point of this compared to the crucifixion? Like, we got totally sidetracked, right? I know I might have gotten sidetracked a little, and I'm sorry if I did, but I'm bringing this all up for a reason. Let's go back to this story. Verse 34. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? This isn't just like, a quiet comment he's saying. He's saying he shouted, My God, why have you forsaken me? He's crying out. We read through the story how he didn't raise his voice. He wasn't fighting back. He wasn't arguing. In the, and in all the gospel accounts, he never fights against anyone, raises his voice against anyone. The only times we see that is when he breathes his last and he dies. In this moment here, this is the only time we see him yell something. And it's, God, why have you abandoned me? Where are you? Isn't that something we've all thought? I know I've felt that, I wondered that. Where are you, God? Try and wrap our minds around this church. Jesus himself, God himself, thought that and felt that. This is what I'm talking about, church. This is why I bring up all the stuff about the Trinity. Because God willingly took a part of himself, Jesus. He removed himself from his divine dance. He took himself out. Completely removed himself. He did it to live on this world and to experience what it is to be human. All the troubles and heartaches and heartbreaks and difficulties of life. He wanted to be one of us to know what it was like. But he not only did that, he took our punishments. Right? The punishment we deserved, he took on himself. And that didn't just mean he, just, he did die for the sins. That's a part of it, right? Our punishment was death. But what does death and what does sin lead to? It leads to separation from God. We see that all the way to the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> right? The tree of knowledge and good and evil. God says, if you eat of it, you'll surely die. Well, we all know they ate of the fruit and they didn't die. So what is that about, God? You're just making stuff up? It's like making fake punishments. And you're not going to actually dish it out? No. What the death is, is separation from him. Adam and Eve are driven out from the garden because they chose that. That's what death is in the Bible. It's a spiritual death. It's not a physical death. Although that did come in the world, the real punishment was the separation from God. That closeness Adam and Eve had has been lost. And in this moment, Jesus experienced that. He completely fractured himself away from God for this moment. And maybe those three days, too, that he was in the grave. I'm not sure how that works. But at least in that moment, he was fractured and severed from his relationship with his father. Just think about that church. How, how terrible that must have been. How heartbreaking that must have been. Right? How many of us would do that? How many of us would sever or cut off that most important relationship in our life in order to forgive someone who wanted us dead? I don't think I would do that, right? I wouldn't give up my marriage with Ellie to 
help someone who didn't care for me and wanted me dead? I, <laughs> I can't say I would do that. Up here, sure, I could say that, but if that actually came to be, I, I don't know. It's such a sacrifice. Like, no wonder he was struggling in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Again, the physical death and the crucifixion, yes, that's a huge part of it, and that must have been very stressful. I can't imagine knowing I'm going to be crucified. That would be horrible. But I think what he was really struggling with was the separation. We see in these gospel accounts, he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. We see that he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Which that's a real condition, a real thing that could happen under great stress. And we see that he even asked God to take this cup of suffering away. Think about that. For a moment, Jesus, God himself, he thought about running from his problem. That's how intense, how difficult leaving this divine dance was. And we know he doesn't. He ultimately says, not my will, but your will be done. He is obedient. He still struggles, and he understands how hard this life can be. And again, this is a perfect, eternal relationship that's been going on forever. Even the best of our relationships last, what, 50, 60 years, which is awesome in a long time, but that's nothing compared to eternity of being one with the Father and the Spirit, perfect, and then just to cut it off, and to leave it just like that? For us? And again, if you've been to some of my sermons, you've seen how messed up God's people have been. Going back to the nation of Israel, to us today, we turn our back on him, we don't want him, we reject him, all that he's done for us, I don't care for you, I want it my way. And all that, and he still goes through with this. Think about how much, how difficult it must have been to leave that relationship, right? Because think about it, the longer you have a relationship, the stronger it is, but the harder it is to say goodbye. Like, think about it, if tomorrow at work, a guy who I've known for like two weeks maybe, if he comes up to me and is like, Brad, we're done, I don't care about you, I'm not going to talk to you, like, this ain't working out, you're not cool, I don't want to see you again, I'm leaving. That would stink, right? I'd be bummed, I'd be disappointed, but like, that wouldn't really change my life, if I'm being honest. Like, maybe for you that would be more hurtful, but for me, I just would be like, oh, that stinks, but I'd move on. My life wouldn't change really that much. I'd be okay, right? You getting me? But say if tomorrow Ellie came up to me, and say we were in a good place, like we're not in a bad spot in a relationship for the sake of the story, just imagine we're in an awesome place, which we are. I'm just using this story, like, Imagine, I'm not saying we're in a bad spot. No worry. <laughs> Don't misinterpret me. Um, for this story, we're in an amazing spot in our marriage and doing great, no issues at all, whatever. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she comes up and says, Brad, I'm sorry, but it's over. I, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to see you or talk to you again. That's it. And it's, I mean, there's been nothing that either of us did. Like, that just came out of nowhere. I, that, would, that would destroy me, I'll be honest. I don't know what that would do. I, I don't know how or if I'd fully recover. I don't know, like, I'd be blaming God. I'd be, I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. I want each of you to think about that in your own life. Remember how I had us look back to the best relationship in our life? Try and imagine that happening. Just out of the blue. Even in a good place, having that relationship fractured just like that. I'm going to read a section from the Jesus the King book that talks about this. It says, The longer the love, the deeper the love, and the greater the torment of its loss. But this forsakenness from Jesus' death, this loss was between the Father and the Son, who had loved each other from all eternity. This love was infinitely long, absolutely perfect, and Jesus was losing it. Jesus was being cut out of the dance. Jesus, the maker of the world, was being unmade. Think about that. He's part of this dance, this flow 
this perfect relationship for all of eternity. And all of a sudden, oh no. You get the idea. He's cut out just like that. And here's what's left. It's broken and fractured. And we ask, why? Why would this happen? Why would you do this, God? Why would you give that up? Just for us? When I think of it like that, I'm like, wow. I don't feel like I'm worthy for that. Did God forgot to give himself up? I don't feel worthy for that. But, it doesn't matter what we feel. It's about what he feels. He says we're worthy because he made us in our image because he loves each and every one of us because he put a part of himself into each and every one of you. Everyone who you see, even the seemingly worst of people in the world and the people that just get on your nerves the most, he's put a part of himself in each and every one of us. We see that Jesus was forsaken by God so that we would never have to be. Again, that was the punishment from the beginning, that we chose to be forsaken, to be abandoned. And he abandoned himself so that we could be brought back in. Church, God is not aloof. He's not just sitting in the clouds, watching us, judging us, zapping us with lightning. He's all around us. He is the stance, the flow in all life because he is life. He's in all of life. The good and the bad, the joys and the pains of life. He's not just like, wow, you really messed up today. No, he's a part of it. He's involved in all of our life. There has never been a moment where God's love has not been pouring out for you. I'm talking to you. Every one of you. And again, if we think about it, that's crazy. Because again, why would he do this? There seems to be no need for him to create us in the first place. Right? What can we offer to him that he didn't already have? Tim Keller talks about this in the book. We could say, well, maybe he created us just so that we could worship and praise him more, give him more love and praise, and that make him feel good, right? But why? He already had that in this divine dance, this perfect relationship, right? It is way better, way more pure, way, perfect, way better than we could ever do. So why would he create us? Why would he put a part of himself in us and make us all in his image? Why would he forgive us over and over again after we keep rejecting him? Why would he fracture himself, give himself up, die this humiliating and painful death for us? Church, I am convinced. Again, this has been so heavy on my heart lately. I am convinced that God created us not just to get more love for himself, more praise for himself. He created us so that he could give more love and give praise to us. It simply flowed out of him. Like the Trinity, that divine dance was perfect and there was just too much of it. It's like there was too much love, too much goodness. He's like, wow, guys, we gotta do something about this because there's too much for us to handle. I gotta share it with someone, so let's just create all these humans, right? I'm sure that's a silly way to look at it, but I feel like that's partly true, right? He just had so much joy and love within himself, he had to share it with something. So he created us, humans, to share that love with. So that we can bear that and share that with others, even when it's hard. We're starting to close. I've got this painting that's been powerful to me lately. It's called Trinity by Andrei Rublev. Got it up there on the screen, hopefully it comes through. This is like 600-year-old painting, really old. And it's really cool. It shows us the simplicity and the beauty of the Trinity. Again, maybe art and this stuff doesn't do it for you, but for me, this is really powerful. You see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit just encircling one another, enjoying each other's presence at this table. That's it. They're sharing food together. And this is the divine dance. 
They're fully content to be in another, one another's presence for all of eternity. Got another one. I came prepared. Well, Ellie did. Thanks, Ellie. Um, the divine dance, right? This flow. This is what has been going on for all of eternity. And this was repaired when Jesus came back from the grave. If we look closely at this, there's a little, there's a little rectangle. Oh, the cross might be blocking it. But if you can't see, at the base of the table, there's a little rectangle and a little squiggle on it. We're not quite sure what that is. But we can see that there's an open spot at the table. And some art historians looking at this painting think that the bottom of the table, that little squiggle there, that if you look at the real painting in Russia, that might have been glue, and there could have been an actual real-life mirror in that spot. So think about that. We're supposed to see ourselves sitting down at this table with God. Church, we are invited into the dance. It's not just the three. He invites us to be part of this dance, this flow, this beautiful, perfect relationship of love. He wants all of us. It's not just an individual thing. He wants us as humans to join him in this dance. Isn't that incredible, right? How wonderful is that? A line that our old pastor Vince used to say, um, he says this really kind of helped change how he views God. It's this idea that God doesn't just love you, but God likes you. Right? God's cool with you. He wants to hang out with you, just in your joys of life. The joys and the things that give you joy and happiness in life, he created these things. He created goodness and life-giving things. Think about it. The things you like to do, the good hobbies, whether it's art, something like art, reading, playing or writing music, painting, something like that, playing or watching sports, whether it's going outside and just enjoying the outdoors, whether it's doing something with your hands, working on a car or a bike, or building something for your house, which is stuff that I love to do. Right? These things that give you life and make you happy and all that. Whether it's watching your favorite show or movie or anything like that. These things that give life, God wants to be a part of that. There's not one right way to commune with God and be with God. He wants to be a part of all of our life. We, he wants us to join this dance so we can have perfect joy and peace. Right? He wants to be our best friend. He wants to be the center of our life. He doesn't want to just be the God up above, the rule enforcer, and you have to believe what I say or else. We don't dare cross him. Don't get in the way of God. Don't make him angry. Don't get on his bad side. And he also doesn't want to be just our ace in the hole, who we go to only in difficult times when we need some prayer. Lord, just help me out with this. Thanks. Amen. Talk to you, I don't know, a couple months maybe. It's easy to do that, right? But that's not what he wants. That's not what we're designed for. He wants us to have him at the center of our lives. And so in a way that we can be at the center of his life. So that we can be at the center of this divine dance, right? This is God's free gift to every one of us, church. And it's hard because we turn to so many other things in this world, but he wants to set us free. The thing, think of the, in your life the things we struggle with, whether it's personal addictions, making money at all, our costs, at all costs, focusing on our career, whether it's alcohol or drugs, whether it's things like sex, things that just are good, some things are good, but can distract us and become idols. Whether it's just going through memes or being on our phones. Whether it's keeping ourselves so busy that we don't take the time to really think about how broken we are without Christ. Whatever it may be. There's other things, right? Trauma we've been through, difficult situations, the doubts of this life, mental illnesses we have, fear, anxiety, all these things in this world that are difficult and we struggle with. Heartbreak, loss, change. There's so many things we don't know what to do. We don't know what to turn to. Some of these things we turn to, some of them aren't bad, but all of them are fleeting and temporary. It's only this love from Christ, his own love 
this dance can fully satisfy us. I want you to think in your life, church, what would it do, what would change in your life if you continue to let go and just join this dance? Again, that doesn't mean that life's always going to be easy. There's still going to be difficulties and hardship. But we can learn to be content in all situations. Because his love and peace can be so close that it changes everything. And Jesus promises that he will always be with us. John 16, verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And church, this is Jesus' death on the cross. This is his sacrifice. He left a part of himself so that we could join in he wants us to be part of this perfect relationship, this dance, forever. And it will change our lives. It's a free gift. You don't have to earn it. It's a free gift. You have to accept it and trust him. And everything else, obedience and all that, that flows naturally out of that. I'm just realizing, God, you love me so much. You will do all this just for me? changes my life and changes how I view other people right because he has that same love for everyone father we love you Lord I'm just, I personally am just in awe of how you would do all of this to help to save us Lord Lord, these are things that are so hard to understand. The idea of Trinity and eternity, what does that mean? Lord, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us and show us what that means. How you left, you willingly left your perfect relationship to save us broken humans, Lord. Because we are in your image and we are, have a part of you and you just love us so much, Lord even when we don't deserve it and we haven't earned it. Because that's the point. Lord, I thank you for your love. It saved me, even when I'm not perfect, even when I'm going through the motions and not living for you like I should want to or should. Lord, we thank you that you love me and that you are faithful, even when I'm not. So Lord, may you touch each and every heart here, God. Show everyone, even if they're struggling to believe it or accept it, Lord, that you love everyone here. God says, I love you because you are mine. You are my child. And he literally went through hell so that we could be saved. How wonderful a truth is that? Father, may that truth of your love for us. May that change our lives throughout this week. And again, as we think about Thanksgiving time, being with family or friends or whatever it may be, Lord, may we ultimately be thankful for how much you love us and want to, us to be part of you. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all your goodness. I will lift up all these things, Lord, in your perfect, amazing name. Amen. May his love change your life. May you be so thankful for that, that you talk about it all the time when you're at Thanksgiving dinner. Have a great week.